putting on an event the size of the Train Mountain Triennial could not be possible without the help of volunteers. Even visitors get a chance to participate. We depend on the participants actually volunteering to do some of the things that need done. Uh, you know, giving train rides is, is to people so that everybody that doesn't own a train can still see the railroad, not just see the trains go by. Just the little, the little positions, manning the first aid station, manning the, the uh, tower out there for the CTC system. But there's a long list of sign-up sheets that we had and people volunteered in basically two-hour increments. People do what they like to do that way. They sign up for what they want to do. It's not a job, it's fun. Safety checkpoints are also manned to ensure all trains heading out on the main line have everything they need for a safe trip. With nearly 300 trains at the meet, the checkpoints can become a bottleneck for traffic. That's good news for those who want to see just what's here. Another thing we have, you know, uh, safety checkpoints. Uh, we had one going out of the, the yard and then we had one at South Portal. And that one was fairly popular with people because they got to see every train go by and, and got some real good uh, photo ops by uh, being at that location. Our train mountain tour has brought us to South Portal, where the main line crosses under itself and the South Chiloquin Road. 
We are now entering what is referred to as the north end of Train Mountain. This piece is considerably larger than what you have seen thus far, and you have only seen a tiny portion of the railroad. With the triennial in full swing, trains continue to arrive. Trucks, RVs, and toy haulers filter into Crisp Yard from all parts of the U.S. and Canada. Train Mountain volunteers keep busy ensuring that all pieces of equipment are unloaded safely, and registrants get to their assigned track. For accommodations, some visitors drive 30 miles south to Klamath Falls and stay in motels. Others bring tents, or better yet, RVs, and camp in one of three campgrounds on the premises. In South Meadow, if you are close to the tracks, you can park your train in one of the sidings and ride anytime you like, day or night. If you're from Southern California, some of the names of the sidings will be familiar to you. Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. With around 100 visitors per day during the triennial, it's a good thing there is plenty of parking at South Meadow. Winding through the cars, RVs, and pine trees are several loops of track, giving one the opportunity to see a great variety of trains rolling through the woods.
Another interesting attraction can be found at Midway, where a second set of smaller tracks parallel the main line. This is known as Gville, a garden railway layout located near South Meadow. Picture this as a layout within a layout. A pair of CSX SD45s power a unit grain train around a loop of track approximately 1,000 feet long. The train passes giant pillars of volcanic rock and rolls through small villages along the shore of a pond. It then crosses a giant steel through truss bridge as the track heads to the far end of the pond. Gville sits on nearly one acre of land and, like Train Mountain, has plenty of room for expansion. It's time to check back in with our train on its way to the extreme north end of Train Mountain. We are now rolling past the switch at Dam 3.5, the new connector track we saw being laid earlier. It's a cool morning in the woods as a small army of volunteers arrive. Let's watch as they finish the track. One little more tap. Good. Les Dent leads a tour train past the construction site and stops to show his passengers the new track. The rock truck is operated by Dustin, a local from Chiloquin, Oregon. Ballast for the project is stockpiled near New England a future site for a yard well beyond the current end of track at Hope Circle. Dustin uses a backhoe to load the specially designed dump bed. The ballast is loaded in no time and we are ready to head back. It's a 30 minute round trip from here to Dam 3.5. After the ballast is raked, a special broom is used to clean the ballast from between the rails. The broom is a commercially built attachment for a weed eater designed just for this purpose. The new connector track at Dam 3.5 is now complete. So, let's take a ride on the brand new rails. Oh 
Not far from here is a large grove of aspen trees. A few years back, a loop of track was constructed through the grove, creating a magnificent ride just made for pictures. Welcome to Aspen Grove Loop. While we've been watching the track work and enjoying Aspen Grove Loop, our tour train has made it past Elizabeth Siding. <laughs> through M&M Junction. And we have arrived at Farmersville, where a section of bi-directional running begins. For the most part, Train Mountain is all one way. There's not much chance of a cornfield meet. But there are a couple places on the railroad that uh, it's bi-directional track. You can go either way. And those places have signals on them. A clear signal tells us no trains are ahead, so we can continue without stopping. Train Mountain is equipped with CTC, which, just like on the big railroads, stands for Centralized Traffic Control. A control tower is located near the throat tracks at Central Station. During a big meet like this one, a dispatcher is on hand to route train traffic coming through the yard, as well as the bi-directional track in the remote north section of Train Mountain. Train approaching 2R. Go ahead, this is the tower. Volunteer John Cooper has put a lot of effort into this system and explains how this works. 
the, the tower right here can pick up the trains uh, starting at the grade crossing that's behind me. We can detect them all the way down the hill through the station here, around the back of the station, uh, around the turntable, and then behind the building we can keep track of them on another screen all the way through k &W switch and through uh, the four-way crossing, uh, Grand Junction, the main, the main grade crossing gates. 3801, proceed signal indication. Okay, we shall proceed to signal indication. Blue blocks on the uh, back shop lead, uh, looking for a lineup into Central Station. Over. All right, into Central Station with the blue box. Here we go. I got an approach signal. Thank you. Out. Well, I tell you, working in the tower is just a total adrenaline rush. You can have so many trains coming at you. I think yesterday we had seven trains at one time. They're all coming in for lunch, and they're all coming from different places. And they're, they're talking on the radio, and you're trying to figure out where they are and who they are and and where they want to go. And you're you're routing them all trying to get them to all where they're going without making people impatient and uh, it's, it's just a neat thing to, to try and keep it all in your mind. The large volume of traffic during the triennial keeps the dispatcher on his toes as trains are lined to and from several destinations. All of this can be done with a click of a mouse. We can control about 16 uh, powered switches from the tower and there's about 20 signals that we can control. Uh, we got multiple routes through the area, so we have a lot of flexibility in how to route the trains and get them to where they're going. And okay, Box Cab, you need to skedaddle here. We got some varnish behind you. Tour trains carrying visitors are the highest priority on the railroad, and John Cooper works hard to keep a green signal for these expedited movements. Les Dent is returning to Central Station after taking a tour train to Hope Circle. John is ready for him. So that's Les Dent, that's 4328. When he comes on the radio, the first question we ask him is how many times he put the train on the ground. You always ask you him. You ask him that. I'll ask him that. <laughs> All right, so there was Les Dent, he just showed up. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, 4328, he'll call in here in a second. At this point right here is those beam big beam oh, okay, break. The He's gonna stick out his left arm right about halfway between here and the next right. segment. So he's put out his left arm to break that left beam that's somewhere out here. Yep, yep. You see the green line has set up uh -huh. to the left, and so he's gonna be coming out of the tunnel at us here. This is tower to 4328. Tell me, how many cars did you put on the ground this time? Hey, my conductor's been on the ground three times. <laughs> no doubt that's less dense fault. I'm not conductor. Oh, now you've been doing it. <laughs> Now at this point I'm going to commit to him and put him into the station because obviously he's an important train carrying visitors and we want them to have a good experience and not have to wait for anything. We try and design the signals to be as prototypically accurate as possible. The uh, model board and the CTC board that we have in the tower is, is uh, pretty representative of what I think you'd see on the prototype and the signals behave uh, prototypically and uh, it's the neatest thing when the guys come along and they're, they're engineers and they're signal maintainers themselves for the prototype railroad and they say yeah this is, this is exactly right. The dispatcher works hard to keep traffic moving fluidly, but there are some things that are just beyond his control. Due to some required maintenance at Central Station, traffic was brought to a halt for a piece of equipment which was fouling the main. For a while, 
things were really backing up. Some couldn't even get out of the tunnel. Fortunately, it wasn't long before the work window expired and the main line was restored to service. The trains were running again too. It's time to check back in with our tour train to see what kind of progress has been made elsewhere. We are now off the bi-directional track and continuing up grade between Whitcomb and Schubert. The distance between Central Station and the end of track near Hope Circle is around five miles by the route we have taken. That's five actual miles. We are just over halfway there. Train Mountain attracts live steam enthusiasts from all over the globe. I'm Ray Gibbs. Uh, I just came down from Calgary, Alberta. My name is Johan Sommer. I am from Graz. Graz is the capital city of Styria. It's a country from Austria. Hello from Australia. That's where home is. That's where all these guys are around. So, yeah, yeah I mean, we got Brisbane, Sydney, Lithgow, Lismore, you know, it's, it's all around. When New West live steam from Alberta, Canada comes to town, the truck turns heads. And if you think the airbrush mural on the truck is impressive, just see how it looks in inch and a half scale. This is a nearly finished replica of the Canadian National 6060, a mountain type 482 used for passenger service across Canada. The prototype is in the care of the Rocky Mountain Rail Society in Alberta. This live steam version is exquisite and one of the most beautiful locomotives at the event. Other visiting trains sailed halfway around the globe and logged several miles during the triennial. Locomotive builder Peter Laws is from Lismore, Australia and talks about his experience at the triennial. Uh, I was here in 2006, um, had a great time then, thought I wasn't coming back because I'm getting a bit old for it, but uh, I've come back again because you know, we all have to go to the mecca of model engineering at some time in our life, and if you happen to get to go twice, well then you're, that's really good, isn't it? Four trains were boxed up and brought over for the event. They were shipped in crates from Melbourne, Australia to Los Angeles, and then taken by truck to Portland, Oregon. Upon arrival to Train Mountain, they had to be unpacked from their crates. This was the first time the Australians got to see their trains in well over a month. But the main thing is to, uh, yeah, to come over here and have a bit of fun and have a look at a few people and meet some people from last time and, yeah. With the trains unpacked and in good working order, it was time to head out and explore the miles and miles of track that Train Mountain has to offer. Way up on the northern track is Panzik Siding, named in honor of Train Mountain member Steve Panzik. This normally quiet place is about to become the location of a great get-together. With plenty of room on either side of the main track, this is a great spot for the whole company to break for lunch. It isn't long before the hoods go up and curious folks see just how these amazing locomotives tick. Conditioner. The oil cycles around the system, the lubricant. Out of the way, Pete. 
Young and old alike enjoy coming to Train Mountain. Been here for five days now and with my uncle and just been riding around on the trains, got a pedal car so I've been driving that around. So it's been a great time. Came with my grandma and grandpa from Manoma, Minnesota. So we drove 1,800 miles to get here. Thursday we are leaving to head back home. And then three more years, I'll be right back here where I came. And then we're going on a ramble through to Vancouver, and then on down into California, and finishing up at LA. And then we ship the whole show back to Australia. 